Hello friends, in the last class we were talking about uh, the compaction characteristics of soil if you remember, uh, which falls under the strength properties of soil which we are discussing and today we will start talking about the shear strength of soil. So, shear strength of soil is one of the most important and very difficult property to assess and most of the times, especially when we talk about pavement engineering, we seldom use the concepts of shear strength to analyze the soil. However, uh, being a very important parameter, it is important for us to look into the basic concepts of shear strength and talk about it. For example, uh, shear strength of soil should be known for analyzing the stability of embankments. We use it during the construction of earth dams. We use it to design the retaining walls and various other structures that involve the use of soil. Now, how to define shear strength? So, shear strength can be defined as the resistance offered by a given soil to sliding and the sliding will occur along a critical plane. And how do we quantify the shear strength? Once we know the definition now, but how do we quantify it? Shear strength can be quantified by two parameters which are you can say empirical in nature and these parameters are the cohesion of the soil and the angle of internal friction. Now, in order to understand these parameters and their relation with shear strength, let us take an example. So, on the right side of the screen you are seeing a body B which is resting on the surface M n and is subjected to a normal force P n here and it is also subjected to a tangential force say F A. Now, in this experiment what we do? We keep P n constant and we gradually increase the value of F A from 0 to a particular value uh, at which this box B will start sliding on the surface M n. So, you can say that uh, what we are doing here if this is F A and we are trying to increase the value from 0 to a particular value let us say F m and this F m is that value of the sliding force at which uh, the, for the tangential force at which the box B will start sliding. All right. So, if you look at this particular uh, picture which is shown here. So, initially the value of F a is resisted by the frictional force between the surface and this frictional force is uh, denoted as F r in this particular picture. Now, the resultant of the normal uh, reaction force let us say if this is the normal reaction force and uh, this is let us say the value of F r all right. So, uh, this the and let us say that because we are increasing this value. So, this value can be from here to here and let us say corresponding to this, this is the maximum value at which the sliding occurs. So, if the value of F r is less than F n till then we observe no sliding of the block B all right. And say that the resultant uh, force of the normal reaction force and the value of F r it makes an angle delta uh, with the uh, normal and this angle is called as the angle of obliquity all right. Now, and the corresponding value of delta uh, at which the sliding occurs. So, this value of delta this is nothing but the angle of internal friction. So, this is the maximum angle and beyond this the box will start uh, sliding. So, this is the angle of internal friction phi we denote it using phi. All right. So, if you see this uh, a particular uh, force diagram, so using this force diagram we can write that F m is basically equal to the P r if this is the reaction force normal reaction force 10 phi. All right. So, if I divide F m by the cross sectional area A and similarly on the right hand side I do the same. So, what do I get that F m by A, so this is the tangential force. So, this is the shear stress here is equal to this is the normal stress 10 phi all right. So, this is the relationship between shear strength and the normal stress uh, 
cons and, and it in includes the value of angle of internal friction. Now, this same concept it can be applied to soil considering that B and M n they are the same materials let us say they are soils. So, uh, you know the, the same equation applies to a soil mass also if we are looking at the critical plane at which the sliding is occurring. Okay. So, uh, if you take cohesionless soil okay, and you do not apply any uh, vertical force the soil will not be stable. Let us say that you, you are taking a cohesionless soil and you are not applying the, uh, the uh, vertical force P n. So, in that case this soil mass will not be stable because they cannot uh, stay intact uh, you know in a compacted uh, mass without any confining pressure. But if you take cohesive soil, now cohesive soil as we have discussed previously they also have some attraction between the individual particles and this attraction is uh, denoted as the cohesion between the individual particles. So, owing to the cohesion between the particles even without the application of P n the soil will be able to resist to some extent the, uh, the tangential force F a. If I want to transform this equation into a general state, so the shear strength will comprise of two, uh, two components. So, one will be the cohesion and the other will be uh, corresponding to the angle of internal friction. So, this becomes sigma 10 phi all right and this is the Coulomb's equation. which tells us about the relationship of C and phi with the um, shear stress and the uh, value of normal stress. Okay. Now, if you look at the equation, this equation can be imagined as a straight line relationship between um, tau and sigma all right, where phi is the slope of this straight line and C is the intercept of this straight line. So, in this experiment if we keep on increasing the value of P n means let us say experiment 1 is conducted with P n equal to P n 1, experiment 2 is conducted with P n equal to P n 2 and so on. At different values if we do the experiment we can get this entire uh, straight line which means we can get the value of phi n c through this experimentation. So, on the y axis it is tau and on the x axis it is sigma alright. So, if we keep on increasing the value of sigma. So, when I say sigma it means the force P n. So, corresponding to that I every time I get a different value of tau because the value of phi will change and so we will get the entire graph or the entire straight line equation and using which we can calculate the value of C and phi to define the shear strength parameters. All right. This is what we have discussed. Now, the next question is that how can we evaluate the value of uh, these shear strength parameters in the laboratory all right. So, there are two popular methods that are typically used one is the direct shear test using a shear box and the other is a triaxial test. Let us learn about these methods we will start discussing about the direct shear test using the shear box. The procedure used in the direct shear test is very similar to what we have discussed while describing the relationship between S and phi which means this particular experiment. In the direct shear test we usually have a brass cup. So, you can see that this is the brass cup here all right. So, this brass cup has, has some specific dimension it can be 6 into 6 centimeter or it can be 30 centimeter into 30 centimeter um, depending on uh, you know whether the type of soil is cohesive or cohesionless. All right. And we can prepare the soil sample uh, or we can take the soil sample which has to be put in this brass cup uh, either in the undisturbed condition directly from the field or we can uh, take the disturbed sample, remold the sample in the lab at the desired moisture content and, uh, the, and, and press the soil sample in the box to the required density. Now, the height of the sample is usually uh, 2 centimeter if the smaller size box is used or it is usually 15 centimeter if the larger size box is used all right. This box is basically split uh, horizontally here. So, you can see that this box is split horizontally at this location 
and the uh, lower part it, it rests on uh, in on rollers. So, the lower part of the box which is again shown here it rests on the uh, rollers and it can be moved horizontally all right. Uh, while the upper half it is clamped it is usually clamped against a proving ring for recording the reading of shear force. So, you can see where the clamping is done and once uh, and once this particular uh, box starts moving uh, this part of the soil will resist this movement and this resistance can be uh, measured using the load cell or through the dial gauge reading in this reaction frame. In uh, this test porous stones are also used. So, you can if I remove uh, the marks here. So, you can see that porous stones uh, are also used uh, for allowing the movement of water if it is desired. So, we will talk about uh, this you know in the next test when we discuss about the triaxial test. In this uh, direct shear test what happens that a vertical force is applied and it is kept constant. So, we are applying a vertical force and it is kept constant. The horizontal force it is increased gradually. So, we are basically moving this lower part gradually uh, at a constant rate until the sample fails uh, in shear along this particular plane. So, here the failure plane is already uh, decided. Now, just, just a note here this not necessarily for a given soil this will always be the failure plane. This is a forged plane which we are uh, using here to uh, in the experiment uh, in this particular experiment. So, uh, the shear force at failure is recorded using the dial gauge placed in the proving ring uh, here and the stress are calculated by dividing these forces that is the normal force and the shear force. Uh, with the cross sectional area of the failure plane. So, this cross sectional area is already known to us. Similar to what we have discussed this test is repeated by increasing the value of the vertical load and using which we can plot the relationship between the shear stress uh, and the normal stress ok. And using this graph we can calculate the value of phi and we can calculate the value of c. Now, uh, though this is a very simple test uh, there are a few shortcomings of this test method due to which you know triaxial test is preferred which we will be discussing next in detail. When we will discuss the triaxial test we will see that the stress distribution in the soil is more uniform in the triaxial test in comparison to the direct shear test. So, this is one of the disadvantages. Now, direct shear test is usually more suitable when we are analyzing cohesionless soil, but that to accept fine sand and silt ok whereas triaxial test is suitable for almost all types of soil. Also in the direct shear test the complete state of stress is not known. We only know the stress at failure, but in the triaxial test we get the entire envelope of the state of stress uh, during the test process. Uh, as I mentioned that in the direct shear test we are already fixing the failure plane here. Okay, but which may not be the actual critical plane in which we will get the maximum angle of obliquity. But when we do triaxial test we will see that we apply normal stresses, but the sample will always fail along the critical plane. So, this gives an added advantage. Moreover in the triaxial test we will also be able to measure the pore water pressure which is an important again an important parameter to be studied though we will be not discussing this in detail during this particular presentation, but the measurement of pore water pressure is usually not possible in direct shear test ok. However, you know direct shear test has its own advantages also for example, it is quick, it is simple, it is less expensive and these features it adds to the advantages. Let us now discuss about the triaxial test alright. So, these pictures uh, which you see on the screen it shows the layout of the test apparatus. So, here we have a cylindrical soil sample which you see here maybe I will use a different color. So, here you use a, a cylindrical sample and this cylindrical sample it is wrapped using a rubber membrane alright. So, it is wrapped using a rubber mem membrane and it is kept inside this um, triaxial cell and it is subjected to a uniform fluid pressure all around. So, it is subjected to uniform fluid pressure through all the sides. When I say all the sides which means that 
I am applying a uniform cell pressure here. Okay. Then what we do, so this is the first step that we will keep the sample and we will apply the uniform cell pressure and then we will apply axial load. So, in addition to the cell pressure, we also apply axial load here okay. and we will uh, apply this uh, load at a particular rate until the sample will fail in shear and the failure will take place basically on internal phases depending on the uh, critical plane. Uh, and this depends on the type of soil we are testing. What we do here, this fluid pressure it is denoted as sigma 3, whereas the vertical uh, axial force which we are uh, applying is denoted as deviatoric stress sigma d. We use different combination of sigma 3 and sigma d and uh, the failure load are used uh, that means we see that at what load it fails. So, the failure load are used to assess the value of C n 5 for the soil. Okay. So, we will discuss about this that how the triaxial test is used to uh, estimate the value of C n 5, but uh, before that let me also tell you that the uh, test can be usually uh, done in three different modes depending on the soil type and field loading condition. All right. So, uh, this is unconsolidated undrained, we have consolidated undrained test and we have consolidated drained. So, when we are looking at the triaxial test, let us divide into two parts, first part and second part. So, the first part is that we are applying the cell pressure or the fluid pressure. So, during this process, if we are allowing the pore water, because if there is a presence of moisture between the soil particles and when you apply stresses, this pore water pressure will develop and it will try to move. All right. So, if you allow this movement, using probably porous stones if you allow the movement of water which means you are allowing volumetric changes in the material. All right. So, these volumetric changes if you are allowing it is called as the consolidated condition and if you are not allowing the movement of moisture after applying the cell pressure you are basically uh, talking about the unconsolidated state we are not allowing any volume change. All right. So, depending on the first part if it is if you are allowing moisture to go out, it is called as consolidated, otherwise it is called unconsolidated. If you try to relate this with the actual field condition, we are basically talking about uh, the state when the construction has just taken place. Okay. We are not allowing the actual load to move over it, but we have just constructed the structure or we have just uh, compacted the particular soil on which the construction will come. So, depending on the type of soil, for example, if it is a sand then typically it has high permeability and the water will tend to move out. So, for, te for testing uh, such type of material probably using a consolidated condition will give you a more realistic simulation of what will actually happen in the field. All right. And if you talk about cohesive soil like clays which have less permeability water uh, does not consolidate very fast in that case unconsolidated uh, condition can be used in the triaxial test. While in the second part, which means you have applied the cell pressure, now you are applying the deviatoric stress here. All right. So, if you are applying the deviatoric stress, which means you are increasing the axial load and during this part, this I am talking about the second part and during this part of the test, if you allow the water to go out, then it is called as drained condition and if you are not allowing the water to go out, it is called as undrained condition. So, here we will define the volumetric changes in terms of drained or undrained. Unconsolidated undrained test is where you do not allow the movement of water in the first stage as well as in the second stage. So, this is also called as a quick test. In the uh, second uh, test which is consolidated undrained, so in the first part when you apply cell pressure, you allow the movement of the water which means you are allowing the volumetric change, but when you are applying the uh, axial force you do you do not allow the movement of water. So, that is called as consolidated undrained all right and uh, this test takes longer time probably one day more than 24 hours to complete. And when you talk about consolidated drain test, so this is uh, you know a more time taking test because in the first part of the test also you allow the movement of water and also in the second part you allow the movement of water. Okay, and this takes about 2 weeks probably to complete for a given type of soil uh, the entire test. All right.
anyways we are not going to talk about in detail uh, because here we are trying to understand uh, the concepts or the strength of soil from the perspective of payment materials. Uh, but uh, these topics are usually covered as a part of uh, soil mechanics uh, in detail. All right. Before understanding the steps of uh, you know uh, assessing the value of C and phi from the triaxial test, uh, let us understand some basic concepts related to the state of stress in a soil mass. If you see the picture, it shows that a body here if you see this is the first picture where you see a body is stressed due to external forces. So, there are various forces acting on the body because of which this body is in a stressed state. Now, through every point usually, so this is a general statement that through every point on a stressed body there are three planes, there are three planes that are unique in nature and that are right angle to each other. So, these planes are unique in some form and they are usually right angle to each other. And why they are unique? Because these planes are subjected to only normal stresses and do not have any shear stress component. So, this has normal stresses and they do not have shear stress. So, shear stress is equal to 0 in these planes. Okay. So, these three these stresses or the normal stresses in these planes, these unique planes, they are called as principal stresses. All right. And these planes they are denoted as principal planes. Depending on the magnitude of the stress in each of these three planes, they are denoted as major principal stress intermediate principal stress and minor principal stress. Okay. So, let us try to uh, denote them using uh, some letters like sigma 1, sigma 2 and sigma 3. All right. So, these are the notations which we can use to uh, describe uh, these uh, three stresses in the principal planes. Now, why are these stresses so important and why do we specifically mention about these unique stresses? Because if these stresses are known, then you can calculate the stress on any other plane through, through that particular point. So, that is also you know one of the major advantage of knowing the principal uh, stresses because once you know the principal stress through that particular point where you know the principal stresses, you can also calculate. Uh, the stress at any other plane for any orientation uh, passing through that particular point. But for most of the design problems uh, we deal uh, with the knowledge of only uh, you know the two principal stresses sigma 1 and sigma 3 they are usually sufficient and many times the effect of uh, the intermediate stress is either ignored or they are taken equal to sigma 3. Okay. So, that is why we are more interested to know about the value of sigma 1 and sigma 3, which also means that we are talking about a two dimensional system rather than a three dimensional system here. You know if we talk about a state that a body is being stressed as shown in this particular figure, then we are also interested to know that what are the principal stresses and also what, what is the orientation of the principal plane. Additionally, we are also interested to know for any given orientation or any arbitrary plane, what will be the state of stress at that particular uh, location. Uh, let us talk about the evaluation process because this will also help us to understand the triaxial test. Let us say that we have an uh, element here. So, this element is P which is taken from some location in this body uh, in which the stresses acting parallel to x and y directions are known. Let us say in this particular element, we know that what are the stresses acting on the x and y direction. Okay. So, I am just redrawing this here. So, let us say we know that what is the value of sigma x, what is the value of sigma y. We also know the value of uh, the uh, shear stresses here tau x y. So, this is tau y x this is again tau y x and this is tau x y. All right. 
So, now let us consider a small element of width d x. So, this is shown here we are considering a small element of width d x oriented at an angle of alpha with the horizontal. So, it is it is making an angle alpha with the horizontal. So, you can try to relate uh, you know uh, just see these two particular pictures alright. So, in, in this particular uh, picture which you see uh, you will agree that the value of d c will be equal to d x tan alpha and the value of a b sorry and the value of uh, uh, e d will be equal to uh, d x sec alpha all right. So, here we are interested to find the value of sigma and tau on this plane. So, we are interested to find the value of sigma and tau. Now, for equilibrium condition from our concepts on mechanics we know that for equilibrium condition summation of forces in the x direction should be 0 and summation of forces in the y direction should also be 0. So, you have to remember that uh, these notations which we are seeing on this on this particular small element they basically indicate the stresses, but here we are talking about forces. So, we need to multiply the stress with the cross sectional area to get the force okay, every time. For example, uh, let us say that if you talk about this plane that is E d. So, here the value this is here sigma is acting, but the component of the force will be how much sigma into the uh, cross sectional area of the section E d. So, this is sigma d x sec alpha. Okay. So, if I want to uh, you know uh, see the horizontal and vertical component of this stress. So, this angle is alpha. So, this becomes equal to sigma d x sec alpha cos alpha and this becomes equal to sigma d x sec alpha sin alpha all right. Uh, similarly, if you see the on this particular plane again uh, if you see the uh, orientation of the shear stretch. So, this is tau here, but the force component will be tau into the cross sectional area again d x sec alpha and if I want to see the horizontal and vertical components. So, this is equal to alpha here. So, this is tau d x sec alpha cos alpha and this is tau d x sec alpha sin alpha. So, I hope this is very clear to you now. Okay. So, now we talk about summation of f x equal to 0. So, if you look at this particular picture. Okay. So, uh, on the x uh, let us say this is positive for us and this is negative for us. Similarly, this is positive this is negative. Okay. So, if you see we have here sigma x d x ten alpha plus tau x y d x plus tau d x uh, tau d x sec alpha cos alpha minus sigma d x sec alpha sin alpha on the x direction this becomes equal to 0. And if we try to again talk about the summation of forces in the y direction it will be equal to sigma y d x plus tau x y d x ten alpha minus tau d x sec alpha sin alpha minus sigma d x sec alpha sorry cos alpha here. So, this becomes equal to 0. So, if you solve this equation uh, I am not uh, spending much time in solving. So, you, you have these equations now just try to solve it to find the value of um, sigma and tau. So, what you will get finally is that sigma is equal to sigma y plus sigma x by 2 plus sigma y minus sigma x by 2 cos 2 alpha plus tau x y sin 2 alpha and tau is equal to sigma y minus sigma x by 2 sin 2 alpha minus tau x y cos 2 alpha. Okay. So, this can be uh, easily derived from you know the expressions we have discussed. Now, before I proceed forward to explain this equation or to use this equation uh, one more step which we can do here. So, let us say this is equation 1 and this is equation 2 what you do you square this equation square and add these equations and before squaring what you do you just bring this term 
on the left hand side ok. So, and after you bring then you just square and add both these two equations. So, again that part I leave to you uh, to do it and once you do it very easily you can uh, find that it will lead to this particular expression ok. Sigma minus sigma y plus sigma x by 2 whole square plus tau square is equal to sigma y minus sigma x by 2 whole square plus tau x y whole square. I will come to this expression, I am calling this expression as 3 now. So, uh, using 1 and 2, if you look at 1 and 2, you can find the normal and shear stress at any plane alpha. So, this expression will give you the normal stress at any plane alpha, this expression will give you the value of tau at any plane alpha. Now, for finding the orientation of the principal plane, so we have discussed that principal plane are those where tau is equal to 0. So, the just put equation 2 equal to 0. So, from here what you get tau x y cos 2 alpha, I am just trying to make it uh, a bit easier for you to understand sin 2 alpha. So, you see sin 2 alpha divided by cos 2 alpha is equal to 10 to alpha. So, 10 to alpha becomes equal to this goes there. So, 2 tau x y divided by sigma y minus sigma x all right. So, this is what you get. Here you can see since this is 10 to alpha which means you have two planes and these planes are perpendicular to each other and by now we know that obviously there are two planes because one will plane will be corresponding to sigma 1 and one plane will be corresponding to sigma 3 and they will be perpendicular to each other. If you see equation 1 and if you are also interested to find out the maximum or minimum normal stress all right uh, maximum or minimum uh, value of sigma what you do you just do d sigma by d alpha equal to 0. So, once you do that again you land upon the same expression here that 10 to alpha is equal to 2 uh, tau x y divided by sigma y minus sigma x. So, this is very interesting that both these two expressions are same which means that the plane having the 0 shear stress or the, the principal planes are also the planes that have the maximum and minimum normal stresses all right. So, this is also an important uh, conclusion from this particular discussion. Now, if you look at equation 3 which I said this is equation 3. Uh, it is basically an equation of a circle. I hope you understand that x minus a whole square plus y minus b whole square is equal to r square. This is what we know the equation of the circle. So, this is of the same form where you see a is nothing but sigma y plus sigma x by 2, b is equal to 0 and r is under root of sigma y minus sigma x by 2 whole square plus tau x y square. Okay which means that the coordinates of the center are this and the radius is this. But how do we draw this circle? If we know uh, the value of sigma x and sigma y and tau x y in a particular plane, then using those values because these are already known if you remember. Okay. So, if you know uh, this then how do you draw the Mohr circle? Okay. So, I will tell you the steps very quickly. What you do here just draw a, an axis system. So, this is sigma, this is tau and this is sigma. So, here you what you know, you know the value of sigma x. So, just mark the value of sigma x. Okay. So, this is sigma x. You also mark the value of sigma y. Uh, so, this is let us say sigma y. Okay. Then, what you do through sigma x? you take a uh, you just you know take a dimension corresponding to tau x y because this is also known and tau x y will also all will be constant in the plane. So, this will also be tau x y ok. Now, you draw join these two lines sorry these two points this intersects at a point O alright. Let us say that this is A and this is B sorry this is B all right. So, now taking uh, you know and let us say this is oh this is B let us say this is C and D. So, taking O B as the radius if you draw a circle I am sorry for this poor drawing. 
So, this circle, this circle is nothing but the Mohr circle. Just let us reconfirm if, if this is the Mohr circle according to our definition, let us say this is O dash. The coordinates of O here, the coordinates of O here are what? Um, sigma x which means O A plus A O. So, O A plus A O is what? Sigma x plus sigma y minus sigma x by 2. So, this is sigma y plus sigma x by 2. So, this is correct all right. And if you see the value of O B, so O B is nothing but A B square plus A O square. So, this is nothing but tau x y square plus sigma y minus sigma x by 2 whole square. So, this is also correct. That is why we say that this is the Mohr circle and oh, this is the Mohr circle and it matches uh, with our equation number 3. So, let me quickly draw the Mohr circle because it got disappeared. Now, if you see this particular Mohr circle, one more thing which you can uh, see here uh, is that the maximum value of maximum value of the y coordinate is nothing but the radius. I hope you will agree to it that the maximum value will be corresponding to the radius here and this is nothing but the maximum value of the shear stress tau x y maximum. So, tau x y maximum is nothing but the radius of the circle. Again a point to remember in the Mohr circle. Now, the question is that how to use the Mohr circle to calculate the stress at any plane alpha which means how to calculate sigma and how to calculate tau using the Mohr circle. So, let me tell you further steps here. So, what you have to do in the Mohr circle you just extend uh, the line a b and join it to that particular point of the circle and similarly if you extend uh, a b you will reach point d and you mark this value as z the z is called as the pole of the circle all right um, of the Mohr circle. So, this is the pole here any plane in the Mohr circle when it is joined with z it gives the orientation of that plane with the horizontal ok. So, if I draw any line through this Mohr circle and reach a particular point in the circle. So, this value is nothing but the orientation of the point P uh, with the uh, horizontal alpha and the coordinates of the point P which means the coordinates of the point P it will give me the value of normal stress and shear stress at point B ok. So, this is how you can identify or use the Mohr circle to calculate the uh, normal stress and shear stress at any given plane alpha. Okay. Now, the next question is identifying the principal stresses and the principal plane. Okay. We know that uh, at the principal plane the stresses normal stresses will be either maximum or minimum all right. So, if you uh, see this particular uh, Mohr circle very clearly you can identify that these points are this particular point let us call this as uh, M 2 and this the next the first point is this M 1. O dash M 1 and O dash M 2 are the principal stresses uh, sigma 3 and sigma 1 respectively all right. As per the definition and, and we have learned about the pole. So, what will be the orientation? So, if I want to find the orientation corresponding to the principal stress sigma 1 I will just join z with M 2 and this is that angle alpha dash ok. Similarly, the orientation of um, the a minor principal uh, plane will be corresponding to this. So, this is the angle all right this is the angle and you can very clearly see that uh, m 1 um, m 1 z. So, which means that m 1 z d is nothing but 90 plus m 2 z d all right. So, which means that these planes are oriented at right angles to each other. Okay. 
Now, one more additional concept which we should discuss before talking about the triaxial test is the Mohr column failure envelope. All right. According to Coulomb, because we have discussed about the Coulomb theory, the condition of failure in the soil is what? That tau should be less than equal to c plus sigma tan phi, is not it? If we know the value of sigma and phi, we can plot the Moore column envelope. And how do we do that? It is very simple. We take the same axis system. So, if you see that this is the equation of a straight line. So, let us say this is the value of c. So, corresponding to this, I can draw a straight line. Similarly, I, I will have a straight line on the other side. Okay. So, this is phi and this is the value of c. Okay. Here, uh, I am talking about a stress condition which is very simple to the triaxial test. So, in the triaxial test, uh, we are applying a value of sigma 1 here and we are applying a value of sigma 3 here and we are trying to see the failure is taking at which particular plane. If this is the particular uh, envelope and I know the value of uh, let us say sigma at the failure plane, I know where the sample has failed. So, if I try to draw a circle such that the straight line is tangential to this particular circle. So, this gives me a more circle. Why it is a more circle? Because this point represents the value of sigma and tau. All right. And I am drawing it tangential because I know that failure will not take place take place you know uh, below this and it will not be possible to stress the soil beyond this particular point. So, failure has to take place within this particular envelope. This circle which is tangential to the Coulomb equation. So, this entire system this is called as the Moore Coulomb failure envelope. Okay. And in fact, the principal objective of the triaxial test is actually to establish this Moore column envelope. So, I will just repeat that how we have drawn. We have done a triaxial test. Let us say we know the value at which the sample has failed. So, we know the value of sigma at which the sample has failed. So, I have just drawn the value of sigma here, all right. And I have just drawn this envelope with a value of c and phi. We have still not talked at how we get this value of. Um, value of uh, c and phi. This is something which we have to talk about. All right. So, please remember that we do not know uh, till now how do you get the value of c and phi, but let us say you know the value of c and phi. So, I will have a circle such that the Coulomb equation becomes tangential to that particular point at which the failure has taken place. All right. So, I think that uh, this is clear to you. Okay. I will come back to this Moore column when we talk about uh, it uh, you know with respect to the triaxial test. In the triaxial test and I mean what is the relationship between the concepts of the triaxial test and all those theories which we have discussed now. In the triaxial test what we are doing we are already defining the principal planes here because in this particular cylindrical sample I am not applying any shear stresses here. I am not applying any shear stresses here. So, these, these planes since it is free of shear stresses are the principal planes. So, if you see this equation 1, very simply you can say that the value of sigma becomes equal to how much? Sigma 1 plus sigma 3 by 2 plus sigma 1 minus sigma 3 by 2 cos 2 alpha. So, in this uh, cylindrical sample, if I know the value of sigma 1, if I know the value of sigma 3, at any plane alpha, I can find out the value of normal stress and shear stress. So, that is the advantage. Okay. So, this makes you know uh, the, the uh, triaxial test a more simpler form of the generic state of stress we are talking about. Similarly, the value of uh, tau becomes how much sigma 1 minus sigma 3 by 2 sin 2 alpha. All right. The same we can understand using the Mohr circle. So, if you try to draw the Mohr circle, so the Mohr circle will be a similar circle, but here this will be equal to sigma 3, this will be equal to sigma 1 and where is the pole? The pole is actually these points, the pole is actually these points because we know the value of sigma 3 and sigma 1 and tau is equal to 0. So, it will coincide with, with the x axis. So, here 
corresponding to any angle alpha at any plane alpha I can find out the magnitude of um, the shear stress and uh, the normal stress and shear stress. Okay. So, I hope you understand that how a uh, Mohr circle in the triaxial test will look like. Now, using uh, the simpler form of the equation that is sigma is equal to sigma 1 plus sigma 3 by 2 plus sigma 1 minus sigma 3 by 2 cos 2 alpha and tau is equal to sigma 1 minus sigma 3 by 2 sin 2 alpha. So, if I want to use Coulomb's equation here what it will become we know that tau is equal to c plus sigma 10 phi. Okay. So, if I put tau and sigma in, in, in this particular equation from here what do we get? We get that uh, sigma 1 minus sigma 3 by 2 sin 2 alpha is equal to c plus sigma 1 plus sigma 3 by 2 plus sigma 1 minus sigma 3 by 2 cos 2 alpha 10 phi. Okay. So, if you try to rearrange this equation uh, taking sigma 1 on the left hand side you get this as sigma 3 plus c plus sigma 3 10 phi by sin alpha cos alpha minus cos square alpha 10 phi. So, this you can solve all right you can get from here to here just by rearranging the expression. Now, in this particular expression the plane which will have the least resistance to shear will be which one? Uh, if you again try to imagine the triaxial test. So, which will be that particular plane? That plane where you will have the failure at the minimum value of sigma 1. Okay. So, the plane having carrying the minimum value of uh, uh, sigma 1 at failure will basically be the critical plane. Okay. When if you look at this expression when will sigma 1 be minimum? Sigma 1 can be minimum is the if the denominator is maximum and to make this denominator maximum I can write d by d alpha to find out that particular plane sin alpha cos alpha minus cos square alpha 10 phi should be equal to 0. If you solve this you get that alpha is nothing but equal to 45 plus 5 by 2. See this is the critical plane of failure in the triaxial test. If you talk about the Mohr column uh, failure theory, if you know sigma 1 and sigma 3, now see the Mohr column envelope. So, this will be the plane of failure. So, this will be equal to 5 by 2 plus 45. All right. And now using uh, this also we can try to understand the Mohr column failure envelope. So, we know the orientation of this plane now. Now, the important question is that how do you determine the value of c and phi just by using or running the triaxial test. Okay. So, before you know we again talk about uh, the triaxial test uh, uh, let me just also give you one additional piece of information that in the triaxial test if you put sigma 3 is equal to 0 then we call this test as unconfined compression strain test. Okay. So, UCS. So, this is just for your information just if you if you understand the general triaxial test if you put sigma 3 equal to 0. Uh, then you can also understand everything regarding the unconfined compression strength test. Again this is one of the test which is popularly used to uh, measure the strength of the soil. Now, uh, we will just uh, very quickly we will try to uh, complete our discussion on the triaxial test. Okay, so, these concepts we have already uh, discussed. So, the last point is that how do you use the triaxial test to get the value of C and phi of the soil. In the triaxial test what you do we will take different combinations of sigma 3 and we will take different combination of sigma 1. Okay. So, at different combination of sigma 3 and sigma 1 what we will do for each combination we will plot the uh, Mohr circle. So, here you know sigma 3 here you know the deviatoric stress if this is let us say sigma 1. So, this is basically the deviatoric stress. So, sigma 1 becomes equal to sigma 3 plus sigma d. Okay. So, here what is the value of sigma 1 then you, you know the deviatoric stress you know the value of sigma 1. So, it is 52 plus 50 102. So, you mark sigma 3 you mark 102 you just draw the circle because you know the radius. Okay. In the next experiment we are taking 100 as sigma 3 and 182 as sigma 1. So, we are taking 100 here 182 here we know the radius we can draw the more circle. In the next experiment it is 200 and then 200 plus 120 320. 
So, here it is you draw the Mohr circle and using this Mohr circle we will try to plot a line such that this line is tangential to all the circles ok, tangential to all the because we know the angle of failure here. We know that this angle is 5 by 2 plus 45 is not it 5 by 2 plus 45 and 5 because this is uh, the same soil uh, should be similar at, at the particular failure point. So, that is why this line will be tangential here and once we are able to draw this uh, failure envelope then uh, directly uh, we can find out what is the slope of this line and where it is actually uh, intercepting at the y axis when x is equal to 0. So, you get the value of c ok. So, using this uh, we understand that how using the triaxial test we can calculate the value of c and phi. In the actual uh, case uh, when we talk about especially pavements our loads are more of repetitive in nature and soil properties are usually defined considering those repetitive load. So, in addition to the value of C and phi the triaxial test in repeated loading mode is also used to estimate another parameter which is called as the resilient modulus of the soil and this resilient modulus of the soil is further used in the design of pavement. So, we will stop here today and in the next class we will talk that how triaxial test itself can be used to calculate the value of resilient modulus. Uh, and uh, today uh, just to recap we have discussed about the triaxial uh, strength test, we have tried to understand the general state of uh, stress in a particular uh, soil mass and we have discussed that if we know the value of uh, vertical, horizontal and shear stresses, uh, then how we can calculate the value of normal and shear stresses at any particular given plane and we have also talked about using these general equations to identify the principal plane and the principal stresses and uh, these concepts were further used to discuss about the uh, case of triaxial test which is a more simpler form where we already know the value of principal stresses. And we have also discussed about the construction of Mohr circle and the use of Mohr circle to calculate the value of normal and shear stresses. So, we stop here today and we will meet in the next class. Thank you.